Thank you for joining Anne's Art Desk. These videos are brought to you by the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation. Let me pull it up a little bit. So then the idea here is that you can stick with one tool, um, but you can start to elaborate on, on what you have done. And then just think about like, what, what would make each one into a little picture, into a little painting or, or an inspiration for an abstract design? And start, you can work with some math and see if you can make something that, that looks cool. Um, and this is very much an, an abstract idea. So I kind of like the idea of filling in this bottom one. And then what else could I do? I like the idea of filling in these ones. And and one thing that's kind of fun about this exercise is you can jump from picture to picture and it doesn't matter what you do next. You're essentially developing um, sort of a doodle language for yourself. And you can add elements and just sort of make new things. For some reason there needs to be another set there. Um, this one, I, I think, needs some, some darks and lights. Does this make sense to you guys? Or are you like, I don't know what she's talking about. It's pretty creative. Yeah, it's very, very creative. Um, and I, uh, I kind of love how when you are doing this kind of thing, Think about whether you, when you doodle in a lecture or a class, um, essentially what we're doing is sort of allowing the doodling to become art with a capital A. And that's pretty cool. I'll post some artists I really love who essentially have made art careers out of doodling. What I love, Anne, just, I'm slowly behind you, but um, it's just that it can take on any form. It's, it's not a, a intended form. So it's very freeing. Yeah, it's very, and you know, each of these little ideas could become a four by six painting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a great idea generator. Um, I really love it. Like, I really like this image right here. Um, yeah. And I really like this image right here. But a lot of what I'm doing here is based on sort of a, a deep and long um, understanding of composition. So as I teach this to you, this is the first time I've taught it, I feel like I need to be talking a little bit about composition. Um, and maybe we'll do that next week because we're running out of time a little bit. Um, does anyone have things they would like to say, contribute? Um, was everybody able to sign into the Google Classroom? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Because yep. um, I can keep adding things to Google Classroom, which will help you out. Um, so something that's kind of, do you want me to talk about composition for a few minutes? Because we have a few more minutes left. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. OK, because you're kind of watching me do something that you haven't been taught, this can be a little frustrating. Um, these are fun. Okay, let me switch out of just drawing and back into thinking and talking. 
um, essentially something I did with each of these little drawings is I made them off center, right? You see none of them, in none of them do you see half or half, right? Here's the world's most boring composition. Yeah, I'm gonna switch to a bigger tool just so we can make better progress. So here's a really boring composition. It's half with maybe something here down the middle. Really, really boring composition. But look how when we tilt it over to 70-30, so we tilt the ratio between light and dark to something like this. Look how much more interesting the shapes are. Just because I, I broke the sort of halvesy halvesy thing. So one thing successful compositions often have is an off kilter, like an, an off ratio. It's either 70% light, 70% dark. It's not often 50-50. And it can also be any of the other elements, like 70% line, 70%, 30% mass. Um, something that's kind of neat is it can also be, let's see, this one, this one is almost 60-40. Um, this one is more like 80-20. Um, so see how these two are sort of reversed. This is mostly dark, this is mostly light. Um, but it doesn't have to be just dark and light or line. It can also be other elements um, such as warm and cold. As we get into color, we'll see this. Um, busy. Oh God. Busy and simple or busy and plain. It can be sort of discordant to calm. Uh, the ratios can be just dark to light. Or even something as simple as like red to yellow. Like they can be color, color casts. Um, so all these things can, can help you make a, an interesting painting. Um, sorry, still drawing. Uh, so when you think about composition, you may want to think about having these ratios be essentially what we would think of as off. They're very seldom. Um, when you, you can do, prove this to yourself by looking at a lot of paintings, but you'll often see that the painting is divided into parts, but not equal parts. Um, as things become plainer, uh, we, so you can compare these two drawings to one another. Here's one drawing and here's another. This drawing, even though it sort of satisfies some of the, some of the basic elements of composition, it's, it's a very calm drawing, right? And, you know, if you wanted to speak negatively about it, you would say that it was boring. Um, but you can also think, oh, it's serene. And look how few elements we have. We can already see it's boats on water at night. That's pretty remarkable that we're good enough with our brains to do that. Very simple. It's almost realistic. You know, kind of at the opposite end of this, we divide the paper up and we make some weirdo shapes. And we think of this one as discordant or a picture of anger or strength. You know, we tend to think of things uh, with a, sort of a judgmental point of view, boring, angry, but it's also simply uh, dynamic versus calm. I mean, we tend to use judgmental words, but in fact, we're just communicating a feeling. And indeed, I can redraw this little drawing into some beautiful mountain lake pretty easily. Take some mountains. Um, maybe there's an element over here. And all of a sudden I'm up in the Sierra in a beautiful mountain lake. And so this dynamic composition that you think, oh, it's, it's angry, all of a sudden transmortifies into being a place you'd really like to go backpacking. Just because the subject matter has changed. And you can also, um, change people's minds about things just by using cool or calm colors inside 
a dynamic composition, which is very useful. So that's a, a little bit of geekiness about composition. Um, so the idea that things should be tilted in some way with some element. Wow, this one's getting really three-dimensional. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and that you can use all these different ways to generate ideas. Something that you could do for homework is take some other colors um, and see if you can just add a color element to these little line drawings. Seems to me that the upsides need to be yellow too. Um, so you can add colors, you can paste things onto them and make them into mini collages. Um, whatever you want to do with them is super fun. So maybe your homework is to like develop this page of, of ideas. Um, you know, let's see. I kind of have this sort of magic, magic tool here in my Posca pens. Because maybe I like this white instead. Um, and all these things can be, you can use different tools. Um, I have these little gel pens. I also have, you know, just old fashioned um, colored pencils. Yeah, this one is a picture of the sky yesterday. Probably even title it yesterday. So there's one more thing I can tell you in the time we have left, if you want a little bit more geekiness. Um, and that's that compositions tend to be um, divided into thirds, like this, with interesting things happening at where things intersect. Um, so when you're composing, you may want to think about this idea of thirds. It also helps you feed the sort of 70, 30, 80, 20 dynamic. Um, so if you look at, let me use a different pen. This one is at one of the intersections and this one is. They're just sort of stretched out to create that sense of calmness. Same with this one. Um, so often if you look at compositions, you'll see this sort of ratio of thirds. Um, and it, it's really useful. You'll see that I did it here too. So things happen at these intersections. It's not really clear with that wimpy little pink. Um, which would look very different if I were to rework this composition and put it on the half these. You would, you would feel very like, what did she do that for? And it would look quite boring if I missed all the, the thirds. Um, somehow we like that better. Any questions? That was a that was a lot of information very quickly. So Anne, I guess um, as you're talking about the the composition of thirds, should we really try to approach each draw, drawing with that in mind? Um, so you can, or you can also experiment with making things at halves or fourths and see if it makes you nervous. See if it makes sense to you. Uh -huh. So one way to discover what the rules are is to break them. Um, and just see what, see what you think of that. Um, the other thing you can do is sort of develop these 12 or nine or however many pictures you drew with a sense of, you know, is there a, uh, is there some rational sense to that? Like, does the picture improve if I add a big red dot right there? Um, it does. <laughs> yeah. You know, does this picture improve if I add a big red dot right there? Yeah. What happens if there's a blue shape right here at this third mark? And sort of a different color over here at this third mark? Um, so it can get quite fun quite fast. 
it, I really love it. Um, I feel like it's a really, really dynamic and creative way to draw in a way that drawing like your scissors or your can opener isn't. It, so there are sort of two important ways to draw. And I think a lot of artists use this maybe without thinking about it. But one way is observational drawing, what we were doing early in the class where you look at something and you draw it. Um, and then the other way is sort of intuitive drawing or abstract drawing, where you're inventing something of your own. And they're, they, they are so together, they're so interested, they're so two sides of the same coin, all water in the same cup. I don't know what metaphor you use, but um, they are sort of two different ways of, of interacting with the world. Um, I am very based in observational drawing and intuitive, one word people use for this is conceptual. It's very new to me. It, it, I mean, for the first 35 years of my life, it had never occurred to me that you could just imagine something and be happy with where it's going and just develop it inside a set of rules or parameters you've set for yourself. Um, and, and that's actually sort of a fun and interesting discovery because it's made my art much more responsive to sort of inner creativity. Um, but you know, all of that sort of inner creativity is based on an understanding of, of what makes things look real to people. Um, you know what 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 makes what you know what what the rules of form and line and value and color are um, I kind of like these little mini mini thingies <laughs> they're fun Anybody have some thoughts or ideas? I will change the, um, I think I had a different plan for your homework, but we didn't quite get to that exercise. So I will change the homework on the, on the, on the classroom and you can submit it there. If you want other people to see your homework um, and give you comments and feedback, you have to put it in the stream. And if you want me to see it and nobody else, then you submit it as homework. You can also do both. Um, in previous classes, the stream on the Google Classroom has provided a way for people to develop friendships and artistic relationships with other students in the class, which I hadn't really predicted, but I thought was just absolutely marvelous. Um, so you can, if you add things to the stream, you can also add stuff like, hey, I really love this artist. What do you guys think? Um, and it, it can become a pretty rich, essentially classroom space pretty quickly if you do that. And I will add things to the stream that I find as well. Um, this one's actually looking pretty cool. Okay, any other questions about how this is gonna go? Any feedback, anybody wanna share something? They're having fun drawing? Um, I just have a question you mentioned in the, um, the supply list watercolor pencils are you going to be doing some stuff with watercolors yeah and when we do um when we talk about color i was planning on demonstrating with the watercolor pencil oh cool um, just because they're such a powerful tool hi jacqueline's child <laughs> um because there's they're so fun to play with and they're fun to work with um i don't think i have them to hand right now otherwise i'd show them to you um but we will use them for stuff like this where we're kind of just filling in the blanks but then also for a little bit of color theory um, because they're excellent for that um, i guess i've had a whole set for years but i didn't realize until you said it on your list and then i went to look i'm like oh i have these yeah and they're they're pretty marvelous because you buy one thing and you get two you get two media because you get color pencils and watercolors but you also get something that's more than the sum of the parts in that you can do very special drawings with them where sometimes inside the same drawing they're used as colored pencils and sometimes they're used as watercolors. Mm -hmm. So they're very 
it's it's a very fun medium to just have in your in your set. Um, I think my materials list included a white pen of some kind, but a white pen or just um, something I often do when I want to change something is I open a can of a tube of, of gouache and then I can just um, find something I want to erase. Uh, so that's one way to, to use, and it's essentially whiteout. You can also use whiteout. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's one way to just have white. It doesn't matter what kind of white you have, but you can just have white if you want. Um, like maybe I want to erase all this stuff. I just have a tube of gouache and use that. This you have to be careful that it is dry before you put something on top of it. Um, Ian, um, what is the white pen again that you're using? Oh yeah, um, these are pretty awesome and I can post them to the stream. Um, these are Posca pens and I have tons of them. They come in different thicknesses. This is probably the thickness you start with. This bigger one you kind of use when you're starting to really paint with them. They're super fun. Um, they're essentially acrylic paint in a tube. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, and they, they draw over things, which is where their power lies. Um, so they're opaque. Um, you know, you can fix stuff with them. You can draw over stuff with them. Sometimes you need two coats, especially in this situation. I'll post them for you and I'll also post a link because if you buy them at the art store, they're five or six dollars each. But if you order them from the big bad Amazon in the sky, you can get a kit of like 24 for 30 bucks or something. Um, so I'll post a link for you if you want them. Um, you may just want to just have the white one in this side. That may be all you want. And the art store will sell you one. Any white pen will do. I just kind of like fiddling with them lately. To me, it makes drawing have some of the power of painting where I can just change something if I want to. Um, but there's a lot of dissent in my household about whether it makes the artwork better. My husband is like, I don't like all the white penning you're doing. Like, okay, fine. I'll keep doing it then. Um, so there's just some different ways to reach white. And indeed, you can just get some white out and use white out. It doesn't matter. Whiteout is probably non-archival, but that's all right. Are there any thick, dark pens, pens that don't have the strong smell that the Sharpie does? Oh yeah, uh, Poscas come in black uh, and they just smell like paint. They smell like acrylic paint. If oh. you have a, a Sharpie with a strong smell, you probably have a very old Sharpie because oh, I think the new that, Sharpies don't it's have very the old. <laughs> Yeah, so the it, turkeys are not very strong. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll try to get a newer one because this is just awful. <laughs> yeah, but if you just, there's also beautiful watercolor pens that really are watercolor paint in a pen. Uh -huh. um, you can use those too. Or an ink, an ink pen. Um, I have a can of, I just have some India ink that I use a lot. Um, and that doesn't smell. Um, so you can buy India ink in a pen that's ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I had one to hand, but I, my, uh, oh, here we go. This is actually not so bad. So this is sort of my field kit. Um, and one of the pens I think I put on your uh, materials list um, are these, these um, Micron Pigmas, and these don't smell. Um, I use the Sharpie to draw for you guys just because um, you can see it. This one I could have used as well too, because it's thick enough. Um, so what I recommend for you for what you want is probably these Pigma graphics. Okay, thank you. Um, they come in all sorts of sizes. And if you look at the top, this will be on display in the art store. This is a number two, right? This is a fairly big one. Um, there are brushes, which are fun. The little brush pen. Somebody wrecked that one, I have to give them one. Um, but they also come much smaller. And they, they even come like in 005, which is tiny. It's how you draw postage stamp size things. This one's a little thinner. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot out there you can get. Um, the, the microns are pretty awesome and they have a huge following online. Um, 
So a lot of people draw with them. A lot of illustrators draw with them. I really love them. Thank you. Yeah. And this is sort of the, the kit I use when I'm in the field. And it would have a pencil sharpener and an eraser in it. Um, so it's, it's a nice little kit. Stuff. <laughs> you know, little, little toiletries kits that are actually have art supplies in them. Um, any other questions? Everybody's happily drawing. All right. Um, so usually I round out chat by asking you, um, what have I said I would put online? And then I make a little note for myself. Um, so let's see, Posco's, um, a pen and ink drawing, my favorite pen and ink drawing book. Um, uh, a few artists who really um, doodle and then make big, a few doodle artists. Um, anything else that's about me? Okay, that's probably about it. Oh, I, I'll also post this to my kit, to the classroom. Um, if you're really into abstract art, I found this is a really nice book about abstract art. Um, so I'm sort of going to use this as a call book or a reference book to teach this class. Um, so you you might want to read it or find it at the art at, at the um, at the library, and I'll also post it to the classroom. I often sort of choose a book for my classes that's sort of a textbook or sort of further reading. Um, so you might enjoy that. Okay, let's see. Um, any other questions? I should probably go and see if my kids need lunch. Put all my art supplies away. All righty. Thank you, Anne. That was a lot of fun. I'm glad. That was a lot of information very fast. I hope you didn't feel overwhelmed. And like you got to draw enough. As, yeah, I felt like it was very hands-on, so I didn't feel like it was too overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I, when I teach kids or adults, I'm like, we have to be actually drawing most of the time. Because that's why I go to an art class. I go to an art class to make art. <laughs> Not necessarily to listen to somebody talk about making art. All righty. Thank you. Okay, have a good time. Post your artwork if you feel like it. Um, and, you know, you can get on there and chat with your fellow artists as well. All right. Okay, thank you. Have a good week. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining Anne's Art Desk. These videos are brought to you by the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation.